Okay, thank you, Tony. Appreciate it. Um, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you in Utah. Uh, it's uh, always good to get out and see uh, other parts of the country and to see what's going on. So what I want to try to do this morning is I've got a presentation called Carbonomics. Some of you may have seen this before. Uh, others of you haven't. Um, if you've seen it before, I appreciate your patience uh, listening to it again. There's a ton of information in here because what I want to try to do this morning is to give you a big picture overview of what's going on in the soil, but I'm going to kind of bring it at you in a little bit different frame of reference or perspective by comparing it to what's going on in the economy of a country. And so I'll explain that here a little bit more in just a second, but uh, just by way of a little bit of background, uh, we farm in south central Nebraska. I don't have a map up here, uh, but we're essentially in the almost exactly in the center of the United States. If you just look at the 48 states, pretty much straight in the center of that. We've been no-tilling there for over 30 years. Uh, we're about half dry land and half irrigated. We are in a higher rainfall area uh, than you guys. We're in about 25 inch uh, annual precipitation uh, on our dry land. Traditionally in our area, the rotation would be corn and beans on the irrigated, and then the dry land guys a lot of times will throw in wheat, so corn, bean, wheat. But since we started down this path uh, to soil health, we've added things like rye and triticale, oats, barley, vetch, sunflowers to what we grow on both dry land and irrigated to try to bring that diversity into the system. Oh, uh, I sh I'd like to start with this picture because this is what we want our fields to look like. We think this is a great uh, picture there on the right uh, because we don't want to see our soil unless we have to go physically look for it. We want to have to scrape away all this residue in order to see our soil because we know if we can see the soil, it's at risk of washing away or blowing away. So this is what we like to see. Uh, this, was, uh, this is corn, dry land corn, growing in uh, wheat stubble from the previous year that had a cover crop drilled into that. So the, the residue that you see there is a combination of both wheat stubble and cover crop residue. So that's what we like. Uh, we started farming, uh, we started using cover crops 12 years ago in 2008. We started experimenting with these. We really liked what we saw that they were doing. Uh, and so we started green cover seed in 2009. And just to give you kind of an indication of how fast the whole soil health movement, uh, the whole cover crop usage, and, and it's still only being adopted on maybe six or seven percent of the acres across the country. But to give you an indication of how fast things have grown, in 2009, uh, we moved enough seed out the door for about a thousand acres, and close to half of that was our own. And uh, this year in 2020, 11 years later, uh, our projections are we'll move enough seed out the door to cover about 1.1 million acres. So that just kind of gives you an indication of how fast things have grown. All the buildings that you see here have been built since 2011, the buildings and the grain bins, just to keep up with the demand of cover crops. So not really going to talk a lot more about that, uh, but again, just, just to give you a sense of how fast the whole thing has grown. One of the blessings that we've had over the years, uh, starting down this path, is that we've had a lot of people uh, that we've get, gotten to meet uh, that have uh, really blessed us with uh, their information and knowledge. One of the companies, the Soil Health Institute, if you're not familiar with what they do, uh, I would encourage you to check that out. But they came to us a few years ago, and they said, we're making a documentary about soil health. Uh, we wonder if we can send a crew out and, and film some of what you're doing. We said, sure, you know, that'd be great. We don't have a problem with that. So they made this, this film, this documentary. It's called Living Soil Film. If you have not seen this, I encourage you to do it. It's free. Just go to livingsoilfilm.com. You can watch the whole thing online for free. It's very, very well done. Uh, they, it's a very professionally done. They sent a professional film crew out to do all this. Features farmers are all across the country. So livingsoilfilm.com. And if you've got uh, FFA chapters or any kind of ag classes in your community, Tell the teachers about this. I used to teach ag, so I know how good a great video is, especially when the teacher's gone. But they've got lesson plans and everything right on the website to go along uh, with the films. Uh, so it's a really good educational tool. But I wanted to just show you a clip out of this because one of the things that we like to do, that we stress and try to do, one of the principles of soil health, is to keep living roots growing as often as possible. So they wanted to get a picture of us with the air seeder here, uh, drilling uh, cover crops. This is drilling uh, cereal rye cover crops at the same time and in the same field as where we're picking corn. So that's kind of what they wanted to do. So I just wanted to show you this clip here. Uh, Tony, go ahead and roll the video. 
So what they did is they sent the film crew out, and it was a beautiful day in October. Uh, I had the hired man go hook up the air seeder, and I jumped in the big four-wheel drive tractor, and I took off down the road. You know, and as I'm driving, you know, this big powerful rig, I'm thinking, man, this is, this is good, you know, I'm going to be a, a movie, uh, could be a movie star, who knows where this is going to go. And I just kind of keep going faster and faster, thinking, man, this is just about as good as it can get. <clears throat> and about the time you start thinking that, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> It's always interesting how God chooses to keep you humble, <clears throat> kind of keep you in your place. And if you look, if you have that resource guide in front of you that was in your booklet, if you look on the back cover of that, here's just a little, a little uh, hint. You can see it looks like a crop circle out in my neighbor's field there on the back cover. That's where I had to drive into his field and hook onto that thing and drive it out of there. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's pretty humorous. So, that is not actually in the film. Uh, that, that would be part of the blooper reel. But I encourage you to watch the film because it's got some great stuff in it. So I show that because it gives me instant credibility as a farmer because stupid things happen to us too. We just happen to have it caught on high definition drone footage there. So, And by the way, it's our number one video on YouTube. Everybody likes to see other people screw up. So anyway. So like I say, I want to, to give you a big picture overview of what's going on in the soil by comparing it to the economy of a country because we inherently understand economic principles. Whether, whether you think that you know it or not, you understand economics because you live in an economy. Every day you're buying and you're selling and you live, live in an economy. So there's these principles, these economic principles uh, that have to be followed if you're going to have a healthy, strong economy. And it's the same things that are going on in the soil. And so I want to take you through these seven keys to a healthy economy and apply them to the soil and show you that when you have these things going on in your soil system, you'll have a very strong, healthy, productive soil ecosystem. So the first thing that we have to understand, and Dr. Beck did a good job of explaining this, is really as farmers, what we do is we're capturing solar energy, so our economy is based on this solar energy, and we're turning it into products that we can sell. And within this economy, there's three main players. There's the soil, obviously, there's the plants, and then there's the biology, or the animals. And when I talk about animals, uh, cattle are a big part of it, sheep, goats, all the animals. But to, for today's talk, I'm not really going to talk about them that much. They are important, but they're not as important as the little guys, the little critters, uh, the bacteria, the funguses, and the different things like that that you can't see. Earthworms we can see. We'll talk about them a little bit more. But I'm going to talk a lot about the role that the biology plays in having a healthy soil economy and the penalty that we pay when we don't have those guys working for us. So the first economic principle is supply. You can't have a healthy, productive economy if you don't have something to sell. You have to manufacture something. You have to create something. You have to have something that you can sell in order to have an economy. So plants are producing carbon. In this economy, plants are producing carbon. This is photosynthesis. You learn this in elementary school, probably. The most important chemical formula in the whole world. CO2, carbon dioxide, which some people think is a waste product. It's not really. It's plant food. CO2 plus water, H2O with the energy of the sun taking place in the chloroplast of a green plant, and it makes, it creates C6H12O6, which is glucose, it's a very simple carbohydrate sugar, and oxygen, okay? So oxygen is a byproduct of photosynthesis, but it's very important for any of us that like to breathe. And the glucose, that simple sugar molecule, is gonna be the building block of many, many other things that happen in the soil, and we'll kinda, track that carbon molecule as it goes through the soil system and what it does. But plants are the only thing that can do this. We can't do this as people, animals can't do this, they can't take CO2 and turn it into a form of carbon that is going to be useful and valuable to other living organisms. And so this, this process right here, this chemical formula, is really the whole basis, the foundation of life, but it's plants turning CO2 into C6H12O6 that really start to drive the economy. The soil, what its contribution is to this economy, is it's providing nutrients. If you look at this chart 
Uh, ignore nitrogen right now, because nitrogen does not come from the soil. We'll talk about that later. But many of these other things, potassium and phosphorus and calcium, magnesium, iron, and the list goes on, these are found in our soils, as Dr. Beck talked about. They're in our soils, but oftentimes our plants can't get to them. So we'll talk about how you make these available for your plants to be able to access and get. So the soil is providing these nutrients. It's also providing a habitat for the roots and the biology. It's giving the things a place to live and to grow. And also, the last thing there, but uh, not least by any means, is water storage capacity. When we have limited rainfall, and everybody has limited rainfall if you can't capture it or store it, you have to have a place to put it. I, I, love, I was at a conference in California, and I heard somebody say this. When somebody asked him how much rain he got, his answer is, all of it. I got it all. So it doesn't matter if you got half an inch or an inch and a half or three, the answer is all of it, or that's what you should have your answer be. And you can't say all of it unless you can get it into the soil through infiltration and hold it, have the water storage capacity in order to hold it. And your soils can't hold very much water if it doesn't have very much organic matter. And it can't get in there if you don't have very good soil structure. So we'll talk about that process here a little bit and how you make that work and happen. But that's a very big benefit that the soil brings to this economy is the ability to store water. And then the biology, what they're supplying, they're producing nutrients through fixation. We'll look at that process later here. They're providing nutrients through cycling and making them available. And they also play very key roles in providing defense and protection for this whole system. Because our economy is always going to be under attack by those who want to take without giving. And we have to defend and protect against that. And oftentimes, it's the biology that does that for us. So that was supply. Now, on the demand side, you have to have both supply and demand to have an economy. Plants need nutrients and water. They need services. They need to be protected and supported. You know, we're farmers. We understand these concepts, so nothing new there. Soil needs carbon in order to function properly. If your soil does not have enough carbon, it is not going to work. It's a broken system. It's going to have to be propped up, and it's an expensive proposition to do that. So soil needs carbon in order to function, and it also needs to be protected. Because the soil can do a lot of amazing things, it cannot protect itself. It has to contract that protection service, if you will, from other parts of the economy, primarily the plants. And I'll talk a lot as we move through this talk about how important it is to keep that soil covered, to keep that armor on top, because we do not want our soil to be exposed so it can be washed away or blown away. And then the biology on the demand side, they have very simple needs and demands. They're, they're living organisms, and they literally will work for room and board. If you can give them a place to live and food to eat, they're going to do some pretty incredible things for this economy and for the system uh, if you can provide the habitat for them. So in a strong human economy, like the United States has one of the strongest economies in the world right now, probably the strongest, and it's reflected by a very low unemployment rate. We have a very low unemployment rate. If you don't believe that, go try to hire somebody, a good worker right now. It's pretty tough to find. But that's because in a strong economy, you've got almost everybody involved in both producing and consuming. Everybody's got a job. Everybody's contributing and making something happen. And it's the same thing in our soil system. Our soils are strongest. Our soils are the best when, they're all, when all entities are producing and consuming. And diversity is very important. We don't want to just have one type of plant. We don't want to just have one type of biology. We want to have a diversity of different organisms out there that are contributing to the system. But what has happened in farming, and, and I, I say this, I say ours, because our farm is no different. Uh, we, we fall into the same thing. What has happened is that we have ignored biology for so long that our soils no longer have the biological activity that they should, and it breaks the economy. And when that happens, when you break an economy, it no longer functions properly, and so then you have to insert welfare. Okay, we're all aware of what welfare is, and, but in, in our system, in our agricultural system, our welfare is when we externally provide the plant with everything that it needs from the outside, from a jug, from a sprayer, when we provide these things, the fertility inputs, the crop protection inputs, it's essentially, we have said our economy is on welfare, or we have large welfare payments we have to make, because here's what happens. The role that the biology is supposed to play isn't happening because the biology isn't there because of the way that we farm. So then our plants start to look sick, or they look nitrogen deficient, or 
phosphorus deficient or whatever it may be, and then we step in because we can't allow them to fail, okay, and, and I'm not saying we should, we step in and we have to provide these inputs. And essentially, when you're putting these inputs in, think of it as a welfare payment because that's essentially what it is. It's a handout to help that crop because the economy, the system is no longer working the way it was created to do. Abraham Lincoln, uh, he was quoting another guy saying this, but I really like what he said here. He says, you cannot help men permanently by doing for them, by continually doing for them what they could and should do for themselves. And I really like this quote because he's not saying we should never help people. Okay? So when it comes to welfare, you know, we need to help people when they need help, but we're not going to permanently help them if we continue to do for them what they could and should do for themselves. And it's the same way with our soil. We're not going to get our soil back to where it needs to be, where it used to be, and where it could be again if we continue to give it all these handouts. And these handouts are expensive. Okay, fertility inputs, crop protection inputs are expensive. Now, I'm not up here saying we need to eliminate all those, okay? Uh, we're not, that's not our goal on our farm. Our goal on our farm is to try to reduce them as much as we can. We don't know how far we can reduce them, reduce them as much as we can to where we can maximize, not yield, but maximize profitability. Because for too long we focused on yield and not on profitability, and we can start to pull back on these inputs or these welfare payments and be looking at profit and not yield. So we don't have all the answers on our farming operation. We think we're going the right direction. We don't have the right, all the answers, but I think we're at least asking the right question because the question we ask now when we try to make a decision about whether we're gonna put something on or put an input in or whatever crop rotation, the question we ask ourselves now is how is this gonna affect the soil biology? Again, we don't know all the answers, but I think we're at least asking the right question going down that road. We really need to get the system back to the way God created it to work, and that is the biology has to be such an integral key part of this system that we have to make decisions based on how it's going to affect that biology, because the, really the rest of this talk is going to focus a lot on the key roles that the biology plays in making the system work. So we talked about supply, we talked about demand, the third economic principle is currency, and currency is important because if you have a consumer and you have a producer, and if they're going to get together and make a quick and fair and efficient transaction, you have to have standardized currency to make that happen. It's the only way to really make an economy go quickly is to have standardized currency, and we have the perfect currency in the system. In our soil system, our currency is carbon. Thus, the name of this talk is Carbonomics because carbon drives the whole system. And you've probably all either heard from your parents or maybe you've told your kids this saying, money doesn't grow on trees, okay? I think we've all heard that. But in our system, guess what? It literally does grow on trees and on corn plants and wheat plants and soybeans and alfalfa. Whatever crop you're growing, you're literally printing your own money. Because in this system, carbon is the currency. So through photosynthesis, we're taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. It's free. And someday we're probably going to get paid to take it, which is even better. Uh, I'm okay with that. And we're turning it into something valuable. C6H12O6, glucose, that simple sugar molecule. That is the currency that the plants are going to use to pay for the services that the biology can provide. And here's how it looks. This is how it works. Plants through photosynthesis are making these carbon payments through root exudates, okay? The carbon, that liquid carbon, that glucose molecule, uh, is converted to other forms of carbon. I'll, sh I'll show you some of this later on. I've got a great picture that shows this happening later on in the talk, but it's actually leaked out into the soil through the root system. And some experts will tell us that as much as 50 to 70% of the carbon that a plant produces at certain periods of its lifespan is not used to grow the plant, but it's leaked out into the root system around it. So in the, in the life period of a plant, as much as half of all the carbon that it makes through photosynthesis can be leaked into the soil. And it's not just leaking it out there for no good reason, it's leaking it out there, it's exuding it through its root system, the biology is coming and eating it and growing with it, and in return, they're providing services like sourcing nutrients, delivering nutrients, and, and, and protecting that plant in exchange for that uh, carbon payment, for that food. Because plants are really smart, okay? Plants are smarter than some people I know. 
Because plants, if they're making that investment, if they're putting that carbon out there, if they don't see a return on their investment, if they're not getting something back from the soil, from the biology, guess what? They will stop leaking those carbon root exudates out there. They, they, they aren't stupid. They're not going to waste that money. They're going to turn that off if there's no biology there in order to deliver these services. Carbon is the perfect currency. It's so important. You and I are 19% carbon. Carbon can be recombined out of that glucose molecule into 10 million different compounds. It's the most important, but it's the most overlooked of all plant nutrients. How many of you ever sat down with your crop scout or your agronomist and said, let's make a plan for carbon? Now, you talk about nitrogen and phosphorus and all these other things, but we rarely think about carbon, but it's the number one thing that plants need, and it's the main food source for soil biology. So if you don't have enough carbon in your soil, you won't have enough soil biology. I know that for sure. When you have more carbon in your soil, it helps to normalize your soil pH. So if you're too high or too low, it can help buffer it right around that root zone. It increases the cation exchange capacity of your soil. It increases the availability of all these essential nutrients. And it can even help reduce the availability of some things that can build up to toxic levels like sodium and aluminum. As a currency, it's perfect because it can be collected through photosynthesis. It can be spent because it's traded to these soil organisms, as I was showing you. It can be saved uh, in the form of organic matter, which we'll look at next. And it's desired by all forms and all members of the economy. In order to have good currency, everybody has to want that currency. And that's what happens in our soil. It also has different states. It has the gaseous form, which is CO2. And as we're talking and breathing here, we're putting CO2 out. It is the liquid form, that C6H12O6 and other combinations that that plant makes, has to be in a liquid form so it can flow through the plant and even through the soil. And then, of course, it can be solid as it's consumed by organisms and it's fixed into their, uh, their, their tissue, their, their bodies, it becomes solid carbon. And carbon can sh shift states very, very quickly. It can go from gas to liquid to solid and then back to gas again very, very quickly. So it's the perfect currency to drive this whole system. And then when we have this currency, when we have excess currency or we have extra currency, we can now turn that into more of a savings account well, which is called capital. In, a, in an economy, when you have extra cash, now you can invest it, now you can save it, now you can buy things, and that becomes your capital. That's more of a long-term investment, and you need to have that for growth and stability. If you just have currency and that's all, you're just kind of living paycheck to paycheck, you can get by, but you're not really building for the future. And too often as farmers, what we're doing is we're just living paycheck to paycheck with our carbon, and we're not really investing or building for the future. And so in our soil system, our capital in our soils is the soil organic matter because that's the long-term stored carbon uh, that we get and that we have when we, when we farm right, when we farm in such a way that we allow organic matter to form. I'm not gonna spend very much time talking about what organic matter does or the functions of organic matter because that could take all day. Uh, I think we're just all going to have to agree that it's really, really important, and it's one of the most important things of your soil. Here's a slide from uh, Dr. Kuchera with uh, USDA, uh, where she talks about all the different uh, benefits of soil organic matter. It is probably the most important thing to know about your soil. If you could only know one thing, there are other things that matter too, but soil organic matter is huge in, in how it drives and how it affects your soil. And one of the reasons is, is because it is that capital that drives our soil and makes our systems resilient and efficient. So in a capital-rich society or an economy like the United States is in, uh, we're, we're productive, we're relatively stable, resilient and efficient in large part because businesses like my, ourselves, we were able to grow our business not because we had tons of money sitting in the bank uh, capital, but we were able to access capital. We could borrow the money at a very fair, cheap rate uh, to be able to expand and build and grow. And so we become productive and stable and resilient because we had access to that capital. And it's the same way with our organic matter. The soils that have the highest organic matter levels on your farm, they're gonna be the most productive, the most stable, the most resilient, the most efficient. They'll be the last ones to show signs of a drought, the last ones to show signs of diseases or insects because that organic matter can help them uh, ward off some of those attacks it makes them a healthier ecosystem. So when we can build the organic matter levels of our soil, we really build for the future into that. 
Now, you can't grow your savings account if you don't have more money coming in than what you've got going out. Okay, that's, that's a hard lesson for kids to learn sometimes. It's a hard lesson for adults to learn sometimes, and I think it's a lesson that governments never do learn. But you can't increase your savings if you don't have more coming in than you have going out. I think we all understand that. And it's the exact same thing that happens in your soil. You cannot increase your soil organic matter unless you have more carbon coming into the system than what you have leaving the system. And in highly extractive farming practices, like growing 250 bushel corn or 70 bushel soybeans or alfalfa or any of these, those are highly extractive, highly exportive. We're sending a lot of carbon out in a truck or in a hay bale or different forms like that. So to overcome that, we have to put more carbon back into the system than what's leaving. We also lose carbon as you have residue on top of the soil and as it breaks down, some of that carbon goes back to the atmosphere, CO2, and when you till, tillage is a great, great way to lose carbon because it oxidizes your soil organic matter, it mixes it in with that oxygen, and the carbon will go back to the atmosphere, CO2. So hundreds of years of tillage in, in some of this farm ground has taken organic matter levels down from wherever you started, four, five, six percent, down to you know one percent, one and a half, half a percent, depends on where you're at, where you started. But you can't increase that unless you have more carbon coming in than you have leaving. And that's why cover crops are so important because most of our cash cropping systems are barely enough to get by. Those crops, and I'll just use corn soybean rotation because that's so popular back in our area. Um, you can insert your own rotation here. But in our area, I tell guys that are doing a corn soybean rotation, you're not gonna build your organic matter doing corn and soybeans. You just simply do not have enough carbon coming into the system compared to what's leaving. And that's why cover crops are so very important and so it plays such a critical role in building your organic matter levels because they're putting carbon into the soil and you're not taking it back out. You're not harvesting that cover crop. You're not harvesting grain off of it. You may graze it and that's okay because still the majority of that carbon is gonna stay in the field, but you're not hauling as much of that out. So cover crops put a lot of carbon in without having a lot taken out. And that's the beauty and one of the powers of the cover crops in addition to a lot of other things, but you will get organic matter level increases far, far faster with cover crops uh, than you do without. So that's, that's the currency, that's the capital. Now moving on to energy and resources. Dr. Beck talked a lot about energy uh, and I'm gonna kind of build off that a little bit, but our energy for our economy comes from the sun. We talked about that at the very beginning. So we're solar energy collectors, if you will. And, and really, as farmers, think about it. What other industry do you know of that all of the energy needed to grow these crops is free, coming from the sun? Okay, now I say all of the energy. We put other things into it, but we don't have to. We can grow some crops with just the energy of the sun. All we have to do is put out these little solar collectors called plants plant the seeds, out pop out these, these solar collectors, these green leaves, we can start capturing that solar energy. And if you think about it, that energy source, it's, it's infinite, okay? There's no limit to it. We can collect it uh, and it, it's, it's, it can be stored. We can turn that solar energy into chemical energy inside that plant and then eventually turn it into biological energy. All we have to do is put these solar collectors out there. And a healthy soil ecosystem should not need significant purchased energy inputs. And Dr. Beck talked about how the goal for Dakota Lakes is to be fossil fuel neutral by 2026. Uh, and I think that they'll get there, they're well on their way. But our prairie soils, uh, the soils across much of the United States, they were built with thousands of years of tall grass, short grass, mixed grass prairies growing without any extra energy other than just from the sun just natural processes. And so we need to try to emulate that as much as we can. And again, I'm not saying that we all have to be fossil fuel neutral by 2026 or even by 2050. We need to start moving that direction. But the goal for all of us should be, how can we reduce the amount of energy used? Dr. Beck said that 80% of the cost of inputs into an agricultural system are based on energy. But if you would look at the budget, your energy budget for your farm, the number one energy cost is not going to be diesel fuel or propane or electricity or any of that. Your number one energy cost, as he talked about earlier, is nitrogen fertilizer. And why is that? Well, 
Carbon is the number one thing that plants need. Okay, so moving on to the resource side, carbon is the number one thing that plants need. We never talk about carbon. We don't spend money on carbon because it can pull it out of the atmosphere. But if you look at this pie chart, this is a pie chart of the atmosphere. Okay, the little tiny pink sliver at the very top. You may not even be able to see it from where you're at there, but it's there, and it's a very small slice. 0.04, this is 0.038, it's a little of a bit of an old slide, but around four one hundredths of one percent of our atmosphere is carbon dioxide. And yet plants can pull most of what it needs to grow uh, out of that four one hundredths of one percent. We can grow crops from that. Now, the crops are getting some carbon dioxide from decomposing residue down below. And, and a lot of times, probably more often than we think, carbon is actually the limiting factor in the crops that we can grow. But we don't think about that. We don't think about how can we increase the amount of carbon available to our plants. One strategy is to have a lot of good residue on the soil. And then as that residue is decomposing, it releases carbon dioxide, which is a good thing if I have a green plant growing up above it, because now the, the stomata in those, in those plant leaves can take up that carbon dioxide from underneath as well as from the atmosphere up above. And there's going to be a much higher concentration of CO2 from down below than from up above if we can capture it and do things right. So uh, that's just kind of an aside point here. But we never talk about carbon. We don't spend any money on carbon, yet it's coming from four one hundredths of one percent of our atmosphere. The blue part of that pie chart is nitrogen. 78% of our atmosphere is nitrogen. There are 30,000 tons of nitrogen sitting above every acre of crop ground in the world, in Utah. 30,000 tons of nitrogen sitting right above your soils, yet we spend billions of dollars putting nitrogen on our crops. We spend zero dollars on CO2 and there's almost none of that. We spend billions of dollars on nitrogen. Here's the reason why this is. There's good news and there's bad news, okay? The good news is, is that we're not dead. Because if the nitrogen in the atmosphere was not held as dinitrogen, okay, atmospheric nitrogen is two nitrogen molecules and they're bonded with each other with three sets of covalent bonds, it's a very, very strong bond and it's not easily broken. And so it renders it completely inert. So as you breathe, you're taking in 78% nitrogen because it's dinitrogen, it's inert, it reacts with nothing in your body. It goes right back out. Okay, and that's good because have you ever had a whiff of anhydrous ammonia? Okay, you know what that can do to you. And if our atmospheric nitrogen was not held as dinitrogen, we'd all be dead. And the rest of this would be pointless, I guess. But because it's inert, it doesn't bother us. That's the good news. The bad news is, is plants can do nothing with it either. So as the plants are taking in atmosphere to strip off that CO2 molecules, it's taking in vast amounts of nitrogen. The plant can do absolutely nothing with dinitrogen. It does not have the mechanisms to pull that nitrogen molecule apart, to put it in a form that it can be used. To fix it or make it available, it has to be broken apart from each other, and then that single nitrogen molecule has to be combined with hydrogen, and with some uh, uh, oxygen, and you can make these other forms that are plant available, ammonia, ammonia, uh, different things like that, that can be used by the plant. So, but the, the key is, is you have to break that bond apart first. So way back in the, in the late 1800s, there were a couple of German scientists, Haber and Bosch, they figured out how to do this, uh, chemically do this, there's a formula how you can do it. But it's a very energy intensive process, it requires large amounts of heat and energy to break that dinitrogen bond. And so they figured out how to do this and then during the wars, World War I and especially World War II, you saw a lot of these big factories built to break those nitrogen bonds and to form nitrogen based products, not for fertilizers, but for bombs. Because it, once you pull that apart, it becomes very explosive. And some of you who are as old as I am in here will remember uh, 26 years ago, the Oklahoma City bombing, uh, the federal building there in Oklahoma City. Timothy McVeigh rented a Ryder rental truck, and he filled it full of ammonium nitrate fertilizer. And that was his bomb, and he completely decimated that huge concrete building. Extremely powerful as a bomb. After the wars... Uh, they continue to produce these nitrogen products, but no longer to make bombs, but to make agricultural fertilizers. And so that's how the, the synthetic fertilizer 
uh, era, I guess, if you will, got started. It started with this process. But it's very energy intensive. So when you are spending money to buy that nitrogen fertilizer, you're not paying for nitrogen. Okay? You have 30,000 tons of free nitrogen over your soil. You're not paying for nitrogen. You're paying for the energy that it takes to put that nitrogen in a form that your plants can use. But what it takes, man, billions of dollars in these fancy, complex factories to do, God created these tiny little bacteria that do the same thing. The exact same thing. Rhizobia bacteria form colonies. They form these nodules on the roots of legume plants, and they're doing the same thing. They will take atmospheric nitrogen. They have the ability to break that nitrogen molecule apart into individual uh, nitrogen molecules, and they combine it with hydrogen and oxygen and make it into plant available forms, which is really cool that they can do that. So don't ever tell anybody, I'm growing alfalfa or soybeans, it can make its own nitrogen. Not true. The plants can't do anything with the dinitrogen. It has to go through the biology in order to do that. Now, as cool as that is, and as cool as rhizobia being able to break that bond, they can't live and eat and subsist on nitrogen. They have to have carbon. And they can't photosynthesize carbon out of the atmosphere, so the only way this process works is if the plant is willing to pay or trade the carbon that it makes through photosynthesis to these organisms to get the nitrogen. Okay, so that's the economy. The plant is paying for the services through that carbon currency to make the whole system work. But this is not just limited just to legumes, okay? The rhizobia are specific to certain legume plants, but there are other things out there like uh, azosporillum and zodobacter, and they're discovering new uh, free-living uh, associative uh, nitrogen fixers. Uh, this is a blown-up picture of what they look like. These things can do the same thing. They can break that nitrogen bond. They can make nitrogen into a form that plants can use, and they can give this nitrogen to corn plants and to wheat plants and to oat plants and to non-legume broadleaf plants. And so this is pretty cool. Why don't we just dump a whole bunch of these out on our cornfield and, and forget putting any nitrogen fertilizer out there at all? Uh, well, that all sounds good, but here's the problem. These guys, rhizobia bacteria, are very, very powerful and very, very productive. If I'm growing 70 bushel soybeans, that takes about 350 pounds of nitrogen to do that. No, nobody would plant soybeans if you had to pay and put out 350 pounds of nitrogen to do it. But rhizobia can produce three to 400 pounds per acre of nitrogen in, in a two to three month period. Extremely powerful because they form these large nodules or these colonies. They're very, very productive. These guys are single celled organisms. They don't associate into nodules or to colonies like this. They're kind of independent contractors, if you will. Not nearly as productive, 30 to 50 pounds of nitrogen per year from these guys in a system. So does 30 or 50 pounds of nitrogen you know, give me the ability to grow 250 bushel corn? Not by itself, maybe in combination with other things that we want to do, but think about what 30 to 50 pounds of nitrogen per year will do for a forage crop or for a grass crop or a prairie crop where you're not exporting all your nutrients. It makes all the difference in the world. And if you, later on this year when it warms up and the grass starts to grow and the highway medians and stuff, just look at that grass. And, and, and number one, the first thing you'll see is there aren't very many legumes in with those grasses. So it's not getting a lot of nitrogen from legumes. But you also will almost never see those plants show any signs of nitrogen deficiency. And it's not because the highway department is out there fertilizing those at night when we're not looking. At least I hope they're not. Um, I give them at least that much credit. It's because they have these associations with these types of organisms that are giving that 30, 40, 50 pounds of nitrogen per year, which is sufficient to keep that system going and growing and keep it green and not show signs of nitrogen deficiency. So when we can utilize these things, we can really do some pretty cool things with our cover crops, with our forage crops, uh, and different things like that that don't have super high nitrogen requirements. But again, they're only going to do that if the other plant, the corn plant or the oat plant, or the brome grass plant in the ditch, if they're willing to pay or trade carbon for those services. Because Zotobacter, Azosporillum, they can't eat that nitrogen that they're producing. They have to have carbon, and they have to get that from the plants. And also, this is not going to happen if there's excess nitrogen in the soil. I told you that plants are really smart, and they really are. They're not going to pay for something if they can get it for free. 
Okay, so if you have nitrogen, if you put nitrogen out there, they're going to use that free nitrogen first before they start paying any money to these guys, any carbon root exudates out to these guys to get that in. And that's exactly uh, what's happening when Dr. Beck was saying in his experiment where they apply phosphorus, they have half as much mycorrhiza fungi as where they applied no phosphorus because the plants didn't need to have the mycorrhiza. Why would you pay for something if you can get it for free? And that's exactly what's going on with the plants. Okay, so we talked about carbon, we talked about nitrogen. Now there's all these other resources, all these other minerals, phosphorus and potassium and magnesium and boron and copper and all these different things. Our soils have these elements in them. It's part of the mineral parent material of these soils, but plants were never designed or made to be able to get them from the soil itself. So you have to employ tiny little miners to extract those nutrients out of the soil in order to make it available to the plants. Here's how it works. I love this article that was in Scientific American a few years ago. It says, mycorrhiza fungi run the largest mining operation in the world. Now, in Nebraska, we have no major mining operations, but when I think of a mine, I think of all this big mining equipment, you know, the big front end loaders and the big trucks. You guys would be much more familiar with it out here. So it's really crazy to think about these tiny microscopic things running the largest mining operation in the entire world, but it's true because of the scale that it does it on across how many acres and across how many organisms. And here's how it works. You see this picture on the right? That's a piece of feldspar. So just think of it as a tiny little grain of sand that's been highly magnified. And you can see the little brown channels or tunnels that are cut into that. And those are actually hollowed out spaces. Think of it as a mine shaft. And what has happened here is that the mycorrhiza uh, can exude the right chemicals, the right uh, combination of chemicals. And there's some research now that's even showing they will actually grow their own bacteria out on the tips of the hyphae of that. And the combination of the chemicals and the bacteria can actually liquefy solid rock material, turns that into liquid, and it brings it back through the hyphal network and it trades it or gives it to the plant in exchange for carbon. Because as cool as what mycorrhiza can do and they can liquefy solid rock, they can't eat that. They can't survive on that. They have to have carbon in order to survive and to do this. And so again, they won't do it without the plant paying for the services. This is what it looks like. This is our buscular mycorrhiza fungi. It grows inside the plant root. Uh, so these little dark round spots are what's called the arbuscle that's actually growing inside the root. Uh, so it has an, a, a direct attachment to the plant uh, for exchanging uh, nutrients, getting the carbon payments and bringing uh, the, the mineral nutrients back to the plant. And then it punctures out through the cell wall of the root and these little hyphae, these little fingers, uh, almost like a spider web, goes out into the soil and it explores the soil and it's what is, is bringing in, it's mining, microscopically mining those nutrients out of the, the rock material and bringing it into the plant. The author of this article, Jennifer Fraser, she says mycorrhiza, they mine the soils just not only for the basic things like uh, phosphorus and, and nitrogen and things like that, but also the hard to come by things uh, like zinc and copper and manganese, which plants need to survive and to stay healthy. She goes on to say, oddly enough, Many of our soils are rich in these important nutrients, but they are often locked up in a form, a physical form, which makes them unavailable to most plants. And that's exactly right. You can have a soil that is completely full of phosphorus, and your plants will be showing signs of phosphorus deficiency because it's not in the right form. The plants were never designed to be able to pull that directly from the minerals. It has to go through the biology first. And when we don't have the biology, we don't see that, we don't have uh, the ability to pull that, our plants are gonna show signs of deficiency, and so when we don't have the biology, that's when we have to start making welfare payments to our system, and we have to add those things in. All right, infrastructure. Infrastructure is another principle of economics. It's the equipment and structures needed for a country to function properly. You gotta have these things if you're gonna grow your economy. And the two most important infrastructures are transportation and communication. We know how important these are because when you declare war on an enemy, one of the first things that you try to do is you try to destroy their infrastructure. You bomb their bridges, their rail lines, their airports, uh, their internet communication center. I mean, think about it. Think about how it would cripple our country 
if all of a sudden tomorrow you could no longer travel anywhere and you could no longer use the internet or your cell phone. I mean, it would literally bring our economy to a halt. China's seen a little bit of that just from the, the virus where they've uh, quarantined people to their houses. It's severely hurting their economy. But this infrastructure is so important to making an economy work that it's a wartime strategy to try to ruin it. So as, as I was thinking about this and the importance of transportation infrastructure, I was thinking about the United States and how important transportation is to what we do as a seed company. We're located right in the middle of the United States. We bring a lot of seed in, we mix it, and we send it back out all over. So transportation is really, really important to us, uh, believe me. So one of the reasons that we have such a strong economy is that we have one of the best transportation infrastructures in the world. You may not think so, based on the roads that you have locally, but if you don't believe it, then you need to travel uh, internationally more. Uh, so this is a map of most of the major interstate systems in the United States. And these are the big roads, the multi-lane roads that allow us to move large amounts of goods and services back and forth. They have high, high capacity to move products. And that's really great, and it's really important, but I'm clear down on the border of Nebraska and Kansas. I have to go 50 miles to get up to Interstate 80. I have to go about 80 miles to get down to Interstate 70. So the interstates do me no good if I can't get to them. So what really makes this work is when you look at the interstates with our highway systems. Now, when you look at the two of them together, there's not much of our country that has decent populations that they're not close to some sort of a decent paved road that'll get them to a better paved road that will eventually get them to these interstates where you can move large amounts of goods and services. And so as I was thinking about that, it's exactly what's going on in the soil. These are some pictures from Mycorrhizal Applications, a company that makes mycorrhizal inoculant. Uh, and these are, you, you may have seen these before, they're pretty widely published. But, but the picture on the left is a plant that has no mycorrhiza, you just see the main root system of that plant. That's the interstate of our soils, okay? Those roots can move large amounts of goods and services, the water, the nutrients, the carbon coming back down out of the uh, plant photosynthates. It can move and transport large amounts up and down, but it can only do what it can touch, okay? How much of the soil is being touched by those roots? A very small percentage. So that is, it's a very efficient transportation system, but it's very inefficient because it touches very little of the soil. The picture on the right is the same plant that is highly colonized with mycorrhiza. Now those same root systems have this mycorrhizal hyphae network that extend and spread out through the soil profile. Now we're covering 75, 80% of that soil now with that mycorrhiza. Those are the highway systems that are bringing things to the interstates that allow this transportation to happen back and forth. And when we have mycorrhiza with our plants, they're going to be far more drought resilient because they can access water and they can access nutrients even in drier soils than what a plant that does not have mycorrhiza. Here's another picture of what this looks like. Uh, again, a highly magnified root. You see the, the dark uh, round arbuscles growing inside the plant roots. And then you see these fine filaments, uh, that's the hyphae, the hyphal networks extending out into the soil. And you can even see over here you see the, the hyphae going from one root to another root. And that's really important. We'll talk about that next year when we talk about communication. The plants can actually communicate things through that hyphal network that ties one root together with another. Uh, mycorrhiza is one of the best things to use to get phosphorus, which is one of the hardest nutrients to pull out of your soil for plants to do that. But they can also grab all these other things as well. And again, in times of dry weather, they can actually help deliver water to that plant as well. Now, it's not just mycorrhiza that make up our transportation infrastructure. Earthworms are very important as well. Earthworms help transport water, oxygen, surface carbon residue. Uh, Dr. Beck talked about how those big night crawlers will pull that residue down into the soil. And they're also actually the public transit system of your soil because other types of biology will actually hitch a ride on earthworms. They'll be consumed by earthworms here, they'll be pooped out over here, and so they help spread and disseminate other biology throughout the soil profile and the soil system. And, and oftentimes people ask me if they should be doing uh, biological soil testing on their soils. And that's a good question. It's a good question. So the first thing I ask them is, do you have earthworms? Because if you don't have earthworms in your soil, don't bother getting your soil tested. I can tell you right now, you can pay me the 80 bucks, I'll tell you right now, your soil is not very biologically active. 
If you're not seeing earthworms, you don't have the other good stuff either. You have to provide such an environment where your earthworms are going to thrive, then you can start looking and testing for other types of biology. Now, don't go out and dig in bone dry, super hot soils and say, well, I have no earthworms. They're only going to be where there's moisture, so you need to be digging uh, when, it's, uh, when you have some moisture there. But you can be looking, uh, even if you don't see earthworms there, see if you can find their tunnels and their burrows, like you can see in this picture, because then at least you know you had them at some point in time. They're probably just down deeper, or if it's really dry, they may have even gone dormant, but they'll come back. So earthworms are really critical. They're the best way to tell if you're moving in the right direction with your soil system, with your biological system. If your earthworm population is increasing, you can see those, you can dig for those, you can, you can count them, and you should be doing that. That's the best way, the, the first indicator. Once you start seeing those and having those, then you can start looking at some of the other biological testing methods. So transportation infrastructure is important, but so is communication. That's the other infrastructure that we want to talk about. Because think about it, if mycorrhiza can bring and deliver all these different things, everything from phosphorus to potassium to boron to iron, the plants are really sensitive to some of these things. And so take boron, for example, it needs some, but if it gets too much, it can be toxic and kill the plant. So if mycorrhiza were just indiscriminately bringing everything that it found to the plants, it would, could actually kill the plants because it would get too much of something and it could kill it. So how does the mycorrhiza and the other organisms in the soil, how does it know what the plant wants? Well, the answer is the plant is telling the biology what it's short on, what it needs, and it's telling it by the different types of root exudates that are being exuded out into the soil. And so remember from photosynthesis that, that carbon molecule uh, is glucose, C6H12O6, it does not stay as glucose. It gets changed into other things. Other things get combined with that carbon molecule, and it makes things uh, like uh, lutein and biochannin and palmitic acid and adenine, all these different compounds. Each one of them is communicating something different to the biology, and the plant is saying, I need boron, I need iron, I need manganese. That's how the plant communicates to the biology through these different root exudates, and here's what it looks like. Uh, there's carbohydrates, sugars, proteins, fats, lipids, oils, the kind of the combination. This is that picture I was telling you about earlier. This picture was actually taken uh, by my friend Jimmy Emmons from Oklahoma. Uh, some of you may have heard Jimmy talk. He's a really passionate advocate for soil health. He's a farmer there. Uh, but he actually took this picture with his iPhone, which is kind of surprising because it's pretty cool. Uh, he has a little proscope, so if you're interested in doing this kind of stuff, for about 150 bucks, you can buy a toy called the proscope. It goes right on your iPhone and allows you to do some pretty cool magnified pictures like this. This is a picture of a cereal rye cover crop root. Uh, and what's stunning about this, you see the main root and then the little things coming off to the edge. That's not mycorrhiza, those are just the root hairs coming off that root. But look at all of the liquid droplets on those root hairs. Okay, look at all those droplets of those root hairs. You almost never see this picture because what happens when you pull a plant out of the soil, what happens to those root hairs? They're very fragile, they just fall off in the soil. So you almost never see those root hairs. And, and if you were to dig it up and you really carefully you wash the roots off with water really slowly, really gently, you can probably see those root hairs, but what happens to those little liquid droplets in the process of doing your root wash? They're gone, they're water soluble, you never see those. So what makes this picture so unique is that you can see them, and the reason is, is because this cereal rye root was growing crossways, it was growing horizontally through a worm channel. Okay, so what you're seeing here was not actually growing in the soil, it was in the soil, but it was not in the soil, because it was growing through the void of an earthworm channel. And so what you see here has not been disturbed by the soil, when he dug this up and he broke it apart, it broke right at that root channel, and he saw this and got really excited. And so he took all kinds of pictures and then started sending them to everybody. And so now I have to give him credit because it's really one of the most incredible pictures I've seen. But here's the cool thing to think about. So this is cereal rye. <clears throat> how, how, how wide is a worm channel or worm tunnel? Not very, you know, a sixteenth of an inch to an eighth of an inch because I don't think he's got big night crawlers like Dr. Beck has. He's down in Oklahoma. He doesn't have the big boys. He's just got the regular native earthworms. So a very sixteenth to an eighth of an inch is all you're seeing right there. 
And a cereal rye plant can have thousands and thousands of feet of roots. You're seeing an eighth of an inch at the most, times that by thousands and thousands of feet for one plant, by, times that by a million plants per acre, start thinking about how many droplets of liquid carbon are being put out into the soil by this cover crop. And this was not a fully grown cover crop. This cover crop was probably 8, 10, maybe 12 inches high. It was growing vegetatively and rapidly, and it was pumping out that much carbon. It's really kind of staggering to start thinking about how much carbon these cover crops can be pumping into our system. And the cool thing is, is that the carbon put out by root systems like this, uh, Dr. Christine Jones from Australia will tell us that the liquid carbon that comes through the, the roots like this is five times more likely to end up as part of your organic matter than carbon that comes from the decomposing residue above the ground. So this rye plant could get six feet high, it could have five tons of dry biomass above the ground, and it could all decompose, but the important thing is, is how much carbon it put into the soil uh, as far as building organic matter. Now there's real benefits to having that other cover up there, uh, but having this growing and pumping that carbon into the soil is really, really important. And that's why cover crops, again, are such a valuable and key part of a soil health system. Now, it's not just that way that plants can communicate. So it's communicating through that liquid uh, root exudate to the biology. Plants can actually communicate with each other as well. Remember from that picture, you saw that hyphae tying two roots together. And that's what happens in a really healthy system when you have good colonization of mycorrhiza. Plants are actually tied together into a network, and then when, in, as this picture demonstrates, when you have one plant being attacked by aphids, it will send a message out through the network telling the other plants that there's aphids around, you better start ramping up your defense mechanisms. And so that's what can happen is the defense mechanisms will be ramped up because the plants can communicate with each other much quicker and much more effectively. There was an article in the Scientist magazine uh, a number of years ago, again, that really d documented and demonstrated this, showing how the hyphal network can tie the root systems together, but it also talks about how plants can communicate with each other and also with insects through uh, a volatile organic compound, it's called, or just think of it as a fragrance or a perfume that is emitted when that plant is under stress or under attack or something. It will emit these smells that communicate both to other plants and to insects. So when you mow your yard and use that nice, fresh cut grass smell that you like so much, it's really your grass crying out for help because you've just scalped the top part of it off. It's part of it, but the plants can actually call in an airstrike from, from predatory insects that are in the area because when a plant is under attack by aphids, it will change the smell of the compounds that's emitting. And if there's any predatory bugs like a ladybug or a lacewing or something around, it can hone in exactly where that aphid infestation is and it can start eating them. But that does absolutely no good if you don't have some of those beneficial bugs, those beneficial insects left in your area. So again, that's why it's important to have, uh, leave some habitat areas where you can have populations of those insects or bugs around so that the plants can actually call on those. Okay, the last area of economic concern is defense and protection because we have a lot of things that we need to defend our system from. Too much water, too little water, wind, heat, cold, compaction, weeds, insects, diseases. Lots of things want to attack our economy and we have to protect against these. So there's several fairly basic things that we can do that don't necessarily come out of a jug or out of a sprayer. Number one is keep the soil covered. This is one of the soil health principles. I think it may almost be one of the most important ones because all the other principles of soil health are not going to work if you don't get this part right. The other principles of soil health don't work on bare soils, partly because if it's bare soil, it's going to wash away or blow away, and then you've got no soil to protect. So Dr. Rolf Derps, who is one of the godfathers of soil health and no-till in South America, he says almost all advantages of the no-till system come from the permanent cover of the soil, and only a few come from not tilling the soil. Always aim at full soil cover. So in other words, what he's saying is, yeah, it's important that we don't disturb the soil. There are a lot of reasons not to. But he's saying one of the most important benefits is that we keep the soil covered. If you could do tillage and not disturb any of your residue on top, it would be much less destructive. But that's almost impossible to do. So always aim at full soil cover. That's the first defense mechanism. The second way is the plants can defend themselves through this signaling 
We talked about this a little bit in the communication part. I want to bring it up again here in the defense part because this is pretty cool how plants can communicate with the biology. I just got one more example here to show. This is an experiment done by students from the University of Delaware. Uh, they took this rock crest plant, which is kind of a common household plant. They infected it with a pathogen called Pseudomonas syringae. And when that happens, when that plant gets that disease or that, that pathogen, it starts to turn the leaves yellow, they'll eventually turn brown, they'll eventually turn black and then fall off, and then a plant with no leaves will end up dying. So this pathogen is on its way to killing that plant. So they've got another plant and another pot over here. They have infected it with that same pathogen, so Pseudomonas syringae is in this pot, but they've also put in this pot a beneficial bacteria called Bacillus subtilis. And so what happens is when that plant now detects that it's under attack by Pseudomonas syringae, it starts leaking out large amounts of those liquid carbon root exudates, and I don't know what combination it is, but there's some combination that signals Bacillus subtilis and says, hey, I'm under attack, I need your help, I'll give you all the food that you need, but you need to come help me. And bacteria can ex exponentially explode their populations uh, in as little as 12 to 15 minutes, they can double their populations. And so what happens, the picture on the right is a magnified picture of the root uh, from this plant right here, and you can see that all the little root hairs off to the side there, everything is surrounded by this green uh, slimy substance, and the green is, was added just so you can see it, but this substance is there, and that substance, it's a biological film which is made up of trillions of Bacillus subtilis, because the plant has now fed this organism enough that these populations have exploded, that it creates a biological film around the plant roots, and it protects it from the pathogen, from the Pseudomonas syringae. And this is what happens in healthy native ecosystems. The, you're always gonna have pathogens available, or pathogens in the soil. We don't wanna farm in a sterile environment, okay? Pathogens out there are okay if they're kept in check, and the way that they're best kept in check is by having good biology there as well. And given a natural native system, the good biology outweighs the bad, and in the, in the end will prevail. Now what the problem is, is when we go out there and we just kill biology, oftentimes the bad stuff comes back quicker than the good stuff. And so we get things out of balance and we have this downward kind of a death spiral to where once you start killing biology, you're pretty well committed to continue to kill it because you no longer have the good guys there to give you the protection from the bad guys. So that's another defense mechanism that plants use. A third line of defense is simply that the healthier your plant is, the better it can defend itself uh, by changing the compounds within the plant. So this is a concept called the plant health pyramid. Uh, this is from a really, really smart guy. His name is John Kemp. Some of you may have heard him talk. His website is advancingecoag.com. There's tons of information about this concept on his website. But basically what he's saying is at the bottom level of this pyramid from photosynthesis, your plants are creating that glucose molecule. It's a very, very simple molecule. It's easily digested by insects. And so when your plants are down at this level and they're just doing the photosynthesis and they've got these simple sugars, these simple carbohydrates in the plant tissue, it is a feeding buffet for insects. They will come and they will hammer that hard. They will hammer it often because they can easily digest that. As your plants get healthier, as they're growing in healthier soils, they will change those simple compounds, those simple carbohydrate sugars, they will change them into proteins, into lipids, and then into what he calls these plant secondary metabolites, which I don't understand, let alone have time to really talk about that much. But basically, he's saying as your plant gets healthier, the, the, the saps and the sugars inside this get more and more complex. They're longer chain. They're much more difficult for insects to digest. And so you just build natural resistance to insects and even as you move up the pyramid, you'll build resistance even to a lot of diseases because of the complexity of the, the, the sap. And he's a big one on taking sap analysis and, and all that. So their plants that are healthy can defend themselves really quite well. Plants that are always under attack by insects and diseases probably are not very healthy and are not growing in very healthy soils. A fourth line of defense, other types of symbiotic relationships that can form. Uh, this is just a quick picture of an uh, endophyte fungus, which is another fungus that will grow inside of a plant root. This is not mycorrhiza, it's completely different. This one stays completely inside the plant root. It gives that plant some disease resistance, it can give that plant some drought resistance, 
and in exchange, the plant is feeding that fungus uh, the carbon that it needs to stay alive. And then lastly, a fifth line of defense is just have lots of diversity. Because if you have something that's attacking your system, it's likely designed to attack one thing, maybe two things. So when we grow monocultures of corn or soybeans or wheat or alfalfa or whatever it is, it is uh, the perfect recipe to have an attack because it's all one thing. So the insects or the disease can come in and completely wipe you out. When you have a very diverse polyculture mix like this, uh, which came from planting seed that looks like that, uh, it confuses the heck out of insects and diseases because it can't really take hold because no two plants next to each other are the same. And so that diversity builds in a lot of resilience. And this is very difficult to do in your cash cropping situation. And I'm not advocating that everybody grows out and plants 18 things, then you harvest them and try to spend time picking them apart. There are people that are growing two or three things together and trying to separate them. My point is, is that when you're gonna plant a cover crop, if you have the opportunity to plant a diverse cover crop, do it. Don't plant two things if you can plant eight and they make sense. Now don't throw eight things in there. If you're planting in October and cereal rye is the only thing that makes sense, don't throw seven other things in just so you can say you had eight things out there. We plant a lot of cereal rye by itself because it's late enough in the season, it's the only thing that makes sense. But if you're planting your cover crop in August, you better be planting more than one or two things because you have the opportunity to build that diversity in there. So there's the keys to a healthy soil. We talked about all those. I know I went really fast, throw a ton of information at you about this. Uh, I think they're videotaping this, so you can probably get a copy of this if you wanna to listen to it again. Uh, there's also copies of this talk on YouTube. If you just go to YouTube and search for Carbonomics or Green Cover Seed. Just real quickly to sum things up, a few takeaway points here. Economies are intricately interconnected and interdependent. And when you mess with one part of your economy, one part of the system, it's going to affect the other part. So when we farm in such a way that ignores the biology, which we have done for way too many years on our own farm, we pay the price with our plants. They look sick, so we have to step in with the welfare payment. So number two is we need to reduce the amount of welfare that we give in our economy. We want to get everyone working, get the system back to the way that God created it to work, get the biology back involved mainly. Number three, increase your cash flow of carbon currency. I tell my guys back home this all the time, when you're only doing corn and soybeans, you're less than 50% efficient at capturing that solar energy and turning it into liquid carbon. You need to add other things into your rotation to take advantage of the sun shining and get that liquid carbon into the soil because that's your cash flow. And then once you increase your cash flow, now you can start investing that. You make these capital investments of these long-term carbon organic matter, and then when you do that, don't sell off those investments. Don't come in and do unnecessary tillage, unnecessary residue removal, because that's essentially selling off the investments that you just made. Number five, take advantage of free tiny workers. They'll do these manufacturing, mining, transportation, communication, protection, and they literally work for room and board. They work really, really cheaply if you can set up the environment uh, that will take advantage of what they can do. Number six, build and do not destroy your infrastructure. You'll really see your economy grow. Farm in such a way that it benefits mycorrhiza. Farm in such a way that it benefits earthworms. Number one, tillage is destructive to them. And number two, fallow periods uh, are really hard on these organisms. And then when you do that, don't do this. Because again, I told you that destroying infrastructure is an act of war. So when you're doing this, you're literally declaring war on your soil. Number seven, protect your economy with soil armor. You've got to keep it covered or a lot of these other things that you try to do are not going to work very well. And then again, lastly, diversity is so very important. Try to build as much diversity into your system as possible. So that's kind of carbonomics in a nutshell. Again, I know it was a ton of information. And it's, it's pretty much on the theoretical side. I didn't give you a lot of, here's how I'm going to home, go home and do this. These are the principles. It's up to you to go and figure out how to put these into practice. But you don't have to do it by yourself. This afternoon, there's going to be some really good speakers, uh, Utah farmers, who are putting these practices, putting these principles into local practices. So uh, we kind of set the table with the theory. Now the guys after lunch are gonna come in with the applied part, uh, it's gonna be a really good combination. You should have a copy of the Soil Health Resource Guide, tons of information in there. 
If you have any questions after the conference, or if you want more of these, feel free to shoot me an email. We printed 40,000 of these, uh, and our goal is to give them all away to people that can utilize them and use, use them.